Gonna keep on moving forward. Keep on moving forward. Keep on moving forward. Never turning back. Never turning back. Sigamos adelante. Siempre adelante, siempre adelante, sin mover atrás, sin mover atrás. Gonna keep on loving boldly, keep on loving boldly. Keep on loving boldly, never turning back, never turning back. Amaremos con pasión, siempre con pasión, siempre con pasión. Gonna reach across our border. Reach across our border. Reach across our border. Never turning back. Never turning back. Vivamos sin fronteras. Siempre sin fronteras, siempre sin fronteras, sin mover atrás, sin mover atrás. Gonna reunite the family, reunite the family. Familias reunidas, siempre reunidas, siempre reunidas, sin mover atrás, sin mover atrás. Can I keep on moving forward?
can worship this ground we walk on, cherishing the beings that we live beside. Loving spirits will live forever. We're all swimming to the other side. I am alone. I am searching, hungering for answers in my time. I am balanced at the brink of wisdom. I'm impatient to receive a sign. I move forward with my senses open. Imperfection, it be my crime. In humility, I will listen. We're all swimming to the other side. We are living in the great big differ. We are washed by the very same rain. We are swimming in the stream together. Some in power and some in pain. We can worship this ground we walk on. Cherishing the beings that we live beside. Loving spirits will live forever. We're all swimming to the other side. On this journey through thoughts and feelings. Finding intuition, my head, my heart. I am gathering the tools together. I'm preparing to do my part. All of those who have come before me, band together and be my guide. Loving lessons that I will follow. We're all swimming to the other side. We are living beneath the great big dipper. We are washed by the very same rain. We are swimming in the stream together. So we can worship this ground we walk on, cherishing the beings of oh, 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 oh. Way in the water. Young girl dressed in blue, way. 
trouble sometimes god's gonna trouble the water but wait wait oh wait in the water wait in the water children wait in the Good evening. Welcome to Cedar Lane Unitarian Universalist Church. I'm Abhi Janamanchi. My pronouns are he and him, and I'm delighted to have you join us for this very special evening. We gather tonight, as we have gathered for over 70 years, on the traditional lands of the Nakachtank people of the Piscataway group of tribes, from which the name Anacostia is derived. We honor with gratitude the land itself and the people who have protected it through the generations. We gather in remembrance of those who were enslaved and worked this land without choice or reward. We welcome you to our congregation. Please know that whoever you are, whomever you love, wherever you are on life's journey, whatever your beliefs, life circumstances, political affiliation, documentation status, or disability, we welcome you. And if you're joining us today online, a special welcome to you. Please uh, share in the chat your name and your affiliation and where you're joining us from tonight. If uh, this is your first time in a Unitarian Universalist congregation, we want you to know that we are part of the Congregational Protestant lineage of Christian congregations, but that more than a century ago, we decided that we would rather build our religious community on the promises we make about how we want to be in relationship and in community with one another. 
rather than based on uniformity of belief. As a non-credal religious community, we honor religious wisdom and spiritual truths wherever we find it, be it in the great religious traditions of the world, or in nature, or in literature, and in our own hearts. Unitarian Universalism is a practical, covenantal, and a prophetic faith. We are practical in that our religious practice grows as we grow in understanding and in our taking responsibility for where our religion takes us. We are a covenantal faith as it is based on a series of promises that we make to one another about how we will be together and work together in community. And ours is a prophetic faith, as it enjoins us not to be self-satisfied with ourselves and the way things are in the world. Our religious approach puts special emphasis in the deeper and difficult work of dismantling structures and policies that promote inequity and injustice and advocate for policies and actions that are just, fair, and equitable, and to live into being Dr. King's vision of the beloved community. With all that rambling preamble, I welcome you again to Cedar Lane and would now like to welcome Adrian O'Neill, who is a member of our Kiplinger Lecture team, to share a few words about the Kiplinger Lecture. I'd first like to recognize the members of the Kiplinger team at Cedar Lane. They are first our fearless leader, David Devlin Foltz, Diane Bellinger, Peggy Jackson, Coral Mumby, Ralph Petersberger, Paul Richter, Kathleen Nepper, and our executive member, Reverend Janamanchi. We're very pleased to have organized this year's lecture with excellent help from the entire congregation, and we are certain that it will be a program that will stay with you for a while. So tonight, we celebrate the 22nd year of the Kiplinger Lecture on Ethics in American Society. The objective of this program is to promote deeper understanding of ethics and morality and to move individuals to apply this understanding in their everyday lives. The lecture series is made possible by a generous gift from the Kiplinger Foundation in memory of Willard M. Kiplinger, who was a journalist, editor, and author. Willard Kiplinger founded the Kiplinger Publishing Company from which originated the Kiplinger Letter and the Kiplinger Magazine, both of which you might be familiar with. Throughout his adult life, he was active in the Unitarian Church. First, he was a member of All Souls Unitarian Church in Washington, DC, and later he became a founding member and key supporter of the Cedar Lane Congregation. He was also a strong supporter of educational TV lending support to our local WETA in its incipient years. William Kiplinger's son, Austin Kiplinger, succeeded his father as chief of the publishing company, and he continued the family tradition of philanthropy throughout his life. Austin Kiplinger honored his father's memory by establishing the endowment grant dedicated to an annual program on ethics at Cedar Lane. We are grateful to the Kiplinger family for making this program possible. I was told that this evening, the grandson of Wilden Kiplinger, Knight, and his spouse, Anne, would be in attendance. I don't know if they are here. Oh, excellent, thank you. Cedar Lane is grateful for your continued support and participation. So now with no further ado, I will pass the mic to Dr. Peter Henderson, who is the Senior Advisor 
to the Office of the President at the University of Maryland, Baltimore County, and also a member of uh, Cedar Lane UU Church, to introduce our 22nd Kiplinger Lecturer. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening, everyone. Uh, it is my honor to introduce my colleague and co-author, Freeman Rabowski, president of the University of Maryland, Baltimore County, or UMBC. I think I'll start off by giving you a few facts about UMBC, just so that you have a sense of who we are uh, at this point in our, in our journey. Uh, UMBC is a multicultural campus that has reflected the demographics of our state. In the 1980s, for example, its student population was about 85% white and 15% black. Today, it is 40% white, 20% Asian, 20% black, 10% Latino, 5% multiple race, and 5% international. It so happens that more of our students come from Montgomery County, actually, than any other jurisdiction. Notably, 60% of our students have at least one parent born in another country. They're attending UMBC to achieve their American dream. I have had the privilege to work with Freeman for the past 15 years. We began our work uh, when I staffed and Freeman chaired a study committee at the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine. That committee focused on underrepresentation in science and engineering and wrote a report that advocated for a national effort to support underrepresented minority undergraduates who would go on to research careers. Later, I went to work with Freeman at UMBC, where we have continued to advocate for our report's recommendations. Now, Freeman's honors are too many to recount, so I'll just mention three to give you a, a sense or a flavor uh, of his career. Uh, first, the American Council on Education awarded him the Lifetime Achievement Award one of higher education's most prestigious academic leadership awards. The National Academy of Engineering elected him a member, recognizing his leadership and success in supporting diversity in science and engineering. And Harvard awarded him an honorary doctorate in 2010. In fact, Freeman was the first African-American college or university leader to receive an honorary degree from that institution since another great black educator, Booker T. Washington, who received an honorary degree from Harvard in 1896. In each case, these awards have recognized Freeman's outstanding legacy of supporting the success of students from all backgrounds. Due to the innovative work of Freeman and his colleagues at UMBC, for example, the six-year graduation rate of UMBC students has doubled over the past 30 years. And today, there is no longer a gap in completion rates between blacks and other students. Indeed, African-American students thrive at UMBC, which is the number one institution for African-American undergraduates who go on to earn PhDs in the natural sciences and engineering. The Howard Hughes Medical Institute has just announced a program that will solidify Freeman's le legacy. HHMI will spend $500 million to replicate UMBC's Meyerhoff Scholars Program at 24 research universities. The Meyerhoff... <laughs> It's a, big, it, 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 it's, it's a big deal. Uh, the Meyerhoff program founded by Freeman and philanthropist Robert Meyerhoff in 1988 is a proven model for supporting underrepresented minorities in science and engineering. HHMI has also pledged $1.5 billion, that's billion with a B, to support 150 early career scientists who demonstrate both scientific excellence and a commitment to diversity. HHMI is calling this program the Freeman Rabowski Scholars Program. This is a legacy that will make a difference. So it is my pleasure now to turn the mic over to Reverend Avi Janamanchi for tonight's dialogue. Thank you. Thank you, Peter, for that wonderful introduction. And uh, welcome, Dr. Robowski. It is such an honor and a blessing to Thank have you. you here with us at Thank Cedar Lane. You. Thank you, Abby. And please call me Freeman. 
Please. Freeman. Okay. Yes. All right. And and I am a bee. Yes. And yes. Sometimes people say there's a buzz when I'm a bee. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we we are going to uh, have a conversation, yes. which uh, is wonderful. Yes. You know, our yes. our Kiplinger lectures have tended to be. Uh, more lecturing. I know, I know. And uh, I appreciated your, your suggesting that yes. we instead try to uh, have a conversation. Yes. So, uh, so I'm going to ask a few questions okay. and, then, uh, and then we'll take it from there. Okay. Sure. Uh, so you, you grew up in Birmingham, Alabama yes. in the 1950s and 1960s yes. during segregation. Yes. And uh, uh, what, what was that experience like sure, growing sure. up and uh, how, how did it impact and shape your life and, uh, and, your, and, and your career? Thank you, thank you. I, first of all, I'm honored to be here. Peter has talked glowingly about this experience at this church and when he suggested it, I was honored to do so. So I'm delighted to be here. I am a southerner. I sometimes say that Baltimore is the upper south. <laughs> I grew up in the deep south, but Baltimore, like Washington, are upper south. Sometimes we think like Philadelphia, other times like Richmond. It depends on the issue, as you know. And so as a southerner, I have to say, two people in the, in the audience who are very close to me, that whom, to whom I'm very close, Lynn Schaefer, who's on a board with you, who is just retired as vice president. Would you give Lynn a round of applause, please? I'm very proud of her. Very proud of her. And Lynn is Peters and my co-authors on the new book that we are writing right now. And then Karen Chenoweth, who, who used to be with the Washington Post, and then Education Trust, who is a champion for underprivileged children and best practices. Karen, raise your hand and give her a round of applause. Great. So thank you for allowing me to be that Southern in doing that. But let me just say, and Adrian will appreciate this because we are both from middle-class Birmingham, a few years apart. And she will appreciate this, but it was, in many ways, um, the experience that middle-class Americans have with hardworking parents, parents of faith, mm -hmm. in the church all the time, That's right. uh, being told that education makes a difference, a house with a lot of books, um, and most important, an emphasis in our community on helping children to develop a sense of self. Mm. a sense of self rooted in our faith and in our belief that we must teach the children they were saying to prepare for a world that might not be fair and so a few blocks from here is Mary Bush who grew up with me across the street who was the number two person at the International Monetary Fund who serves on a lot of corporate boards she was sitting around several blocks was Condi Rice, yes. and a few more blocks over by Adrian was Angela Davis. Mm -hmm. So that was that middle-class black community that was preparing us to lead in a world that was not necessarily ready for us to lead, yes. in a world that would be different from the world in which we had been reared, in that there would be people who looked different from us. Because my world was completely black. I never talked to a white person, ever before my mother and father sent me to Massachusetts in the summers in high school to see what it would be like to be in class with white children. Mm. And that's the 10 year difference between us and that Adrian was in an integrated school for a while. Mine was totally black and that was, that was the environment. Yeah. Wow. Mm -hmm. uh, you met the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Yes. Yes. And yes. you were deeply inspired yes. both by his presence and his yes. words. Yes. And uh, that inspired you uh, to even uh, pick a fight with your parents and <laughs> convince them to go participate in the yeah. Children's March sure. in 1963. Yes, yes. And uh, you and uh, hundreds of other black children and youth faced snarling dogs yes. and water cannons yes. and arrests yes. in order to take a principal stand yes. against segregation. Yes. And uh, you also spent five terrible nights in jail, yep. having encountered Bull Connor. Yep. yep. And uh, upon your release, you and the children then listened to powerful words from Dr. King. Yes. yes. Uh, which you have described as being life-altering. Yes. And uh, Dr. King 
said mm -hmm. that day that what you do this day mm -hmm. will have an impact on generations yes. as yet known. Yes. yes. Would you share a little bit more about sure. that experience sure. and and what it has, what it meant to you then, and what it meant to America at that time? Sure. And how has that transformed you? Sure. The the most important part of all of that is I'm sitting in the back of church, in the back. Dr. King is up here. He's talking. I did not want to be there. What kid wants to be in church in the middle of the week? <laughs> they placate me by allowing me to bring my math problems. I was always a math nerd. So I'm doing math and I'm eating. I was uh, a fan of M&Ms, the good kind with the peanuts. <laughs> So I'm eating the M&Ms. <laughs> it's the human experience, right? And I'm doing my little algebra word problems. And all of a sudden, this minister says, if the children participate in this peaceful protest, all of America will understand that even our children know the difference between right and wrong, and the kids will be able to go to better schools. All right? Now, our teachers, our black teachers, were so hardworking and really were supportive. We didn't have the resources, uh, and we were given those hand-me-down books from the white schools, which was so, so bothersome. And you couldn't bring new books that your parents might buy because you'd be different. So imagine the feeling a child has when he knows that the books he has to use have already been used for years by white children are torn yes. up, right? So I, I wanted to go because I wanted to see what those good schools were like. And what I really wanted to see was if they were any smarter than I was. Mm. Because to me, being smart meant being excited about learning, being willing to work really hard. And I knew I was always working. And so I did go, and it was horrific as an experience, but it was also empowering. Horrific in that you had too many children in the space, not enough restrooms. Many of the children were much younger than I. They were crying. Uh, they put us in with the bad boys, the ones who were there not because of the protests. They would want to beat up kids, right? It was all of that, and most important, in the middle of that experience, our parents came on the outside. Imagine the children looking out the windows in jail because they wanted a better education. And he said just what you said. We didn't understand the profundity, but we knew it meant something that somehow life would be better for other children. Mm. And so the kids were just crying. We were just trying to keep them. And I was afraid. I was, very, I was not a courageous kid. If a fight broke out, Freeman was running the other way. I often say the only thing I ever attacked was a math problem, all right? So it was not about courage, but I really did want to know, what's this better school system like? That was the point. And, that, and I was, one other experience, we got out, and um, all of a sudden the Board of Education said all children who marched must be expelled from school. Wow. And I was an A student. It was... And my pastor, not my pastor, excuse me, well, actually, turns out my high school counselor was the father of Condi Rice, and my high school principal was the uncle of Alma Vivian Powell. Mm. We're all middle-class Birminghamians. And um, Mr. Bell, who was a mathematician who inspired me to want to be a mathematician, called the entire school to order, all of us for a town hall meeting. He did not want to expel those children. He had no choice, but this is one of the first examples of courageous leadership that I will always remember. He decided creatively to have the town hall meeting with the same setup as the induction into the National Honor Society. And he called each child to the stage to stand, each child who had been in jail. And then he gave a little talk. And to us, he had talked about the row and civil disobedience. And he talked about sometimes having to do things that he did not want to do, but that he wanted to do them with authenticity. Mm. And then he looked to the audience of teachers and children, and he said, look into the faces of courage. Wow. And by that time, we were all with tears, and the audience gave us a standing ovation. So he took that moment of shame away from us, because it was a shame to be thinking about the idea of being expelled, and made it a moment of pride. Yes. Within a few days, 
a federal judge in Atlanta, and his last name was Black, I'll never forget that, demanded that the school system bring us back to school, and we were brought back to school. An experience I will never forget. Incredible. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Uh, later that year, the Ku Klux Klan members mm -hmm. bombed the 16th Street Baptist Church mm -hmm. in Birmingham, mm -hmm. killing four young girls, mm -hmm. Denise McNair, Addie Mae Collins, Cynthia Wesley, and Carol Richardson. Mm -hmm. And one of them was your friend. Yes, 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 yes. And former Senator Doug Jones yes. brought the killers to justice yes, only did. recently. Yes, yes. How important is understanding this history yes. and the history of race relations yes. in the United States more broadly in order to not only recognize but also to face the challenges that we find ourselves both in society sure. and education sure. today. Sure, sure. First of all, history, as all of you know, history is so important that 1963 year was one in which we saw the little girls killed. We saw our beloved John Kennedy killed, right? Uh, and when I've written about it, I've often talked about the fact that for most people in America today, that history of 1963 is as distant as the Civil War. Mm. So if I were to ask this audience, what percent of Americans do you think had not been born in 1963? What percent of Americans today had not even come into the world? Anybody have an example? What would you think? What percent of the Americans? What would you say? 75. 75? It's over two-thirds. Over two-thirds of Americans. It's probably very close to 70 at this point. You know, and, and to, usually in audiences, this is a very seasoned audience of all ages. How many of you were in the world in 1963? I appreciate that. I'm so glad to see your hands. In most audiences, when I say that, most people say, oh, no, we hadn't been born. And I always say that's perfectly disgusting when everybody's born. <laughs> but the fact, and the reason I say that is, if you were not around in the 60s, it's hard to understand the magnitude of some things that happened. Mm -hmm. If you were not around to feel that something in your stomach when President Kennedy was killed, it's just something on paper, you know? And, and that's why it's important to tell the story, to tell the story, that's number one. Number two, it's just by chance, UMBC was actually established the same year that I was in jail, 1963. Wow. The charter for UMBC, 1963. The first young people went in to that college the same year I started at Hampton, 1966. And the significance of the UMBC experience was that it was the first time in this state that a university was founded at such a time that kids of all races could go there. Every other university had been founded either for blacks or for whites, that was the world at that time. And so it was, our campus was an experiment just as American society was going through an experiment. And the question was, really was, can we develop laws that will lead to a mixing of the races from different backgrounds in schools, in universities, right? Can we have less segregation on all these levels mm -hmm. was the question that was being raised. And, and I will tell you, the, the, the fact is that this has been a 60, as Peter and I work on different projects, as we're working now, Lynn, with this book, it's that 60 year experiment for education, for higher education, but for our society. And then what was it like? The bombing of the church, just as we heard the horrors in the past few weeks and in this last Texas case of the decapitation of children. Mm -hmm. As often, we in Birmingham will never forget the little girl's hand that was found with the ring. Her dad had given her a ring mm -hmm. that morning. We had nightmares as children thinking about that hand, you see. And, and it, 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 talk about the parallelism. It's the idea of violence yes. and hatred and discrimination and racism. And somehow people 
whether or not people can become so uncomfortable that they say no more. That's the question, that they say no more. We have become so numb to violence and mass shootings, but shootings every day in our cities. That's right. So the, whether it's about a gun violence or the bombs, uh, on Adrian Street, the, the most famous black attorney, Shores, his house was bombed more than once. And so they called her neighborhood Bomb Hill because, because there were bombs. And so for us, when that church was bombed, it was the sister church in my church, um, every Sunday we were scared. Every Sunday we were scared, will this happen again? Because if little girls dressed in white can be bummed while they're looking in the mirror in a restroom, what about the rest of us? Yes. Just as children today, when they go to school, are wondering, will this happen to us? So the same feeling that people have today about violence, gun violence, we had then. Right, right. Uh, Adrian Marie Brown said something that has really stuck with me. Okay. Uh, she was responding to people lamenting that somehow things have gotten worse now. And her response was, it's not that things have gotten worse. Oh, yeah. There is now things are being uncovered. Yes, yes. And yes. We are present at a moment yes. where we are being called to hold each other more tightly mm -hmm. and be engaged mm -hmm. in the work of liberation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, and to me, what you shared with, with especially the need for us to know yes. and remember our history, history. Yes. which yes. now, you know, there is, there is a real effort. Yes to not only ignore history, yes, but yes. obfuscate and, yes. and deny yes. history. Yes, yes. That, that how do we learn, yes. cultivate yes. the ability to sit with that discomfort, right. that spiritual discomfort right. we feel when we are confronted with truth yes. that is not easy, yeah. you know, there's, there's, you know, growing up in India, yeah. I've always been struck by both the, the, both the sense of exceptionalism yes. that the United States portrays, yes. as well as that sense of innocence, yeah. Yeah. Uh, both of which I feel come into play yeah. when, when we start looking at our history from yes. a selective lens. Yes. And I'm just wondering how, sure. how you see that, sure. Dr. Hrabowski, sure. especially now in, yeah. in how these, we, we again see them being uncovered yes. more. You know, we, we talk about ethical issues in our society. Um, and I will say several things that when I was growing up, we had something called Baptist Training Unit, but we also had the Youth Fellowship that Cundy Rice's father, who was Presbyterian, would come to the Baptist church and work with us on. And um, I'd say that because we were always looking at our values. Mm. There's a poem by Olive Schreiner, uh, who was a, a South African missionary. Uh, and it, the title is, May You Seek After Truth. And it goes through. And at the end it says, um, Die poor, unknown, a failure, but shut your eyes to nothing that seems to them to be the truth, mm. all right? And what I remember about that is that we were in the community helping children to understand how to develop that moral compass between right and wrong on the one hand, and how to learn how to talk to people about difficult issues, difficult issues. And we're working in universities. This new book that Lynn and Peter and I are working on, the last book on the Empowered University, this one may be called the Resilient University, but we have not learned in America how to have these difficult conversations with people different from ourselves. Yes. And, and, one, and one of the statements we make is, we say we must learn how to agree to disagree agreeably. Mm -hmm. Or to agree to disagree with civility that we can't make progress if people don't say what they really think. 
And if something upsets us, we have to learn how to breathe deeply and pause. I, Adrian was telling me about uh, teaching meditation. In being mindful, we use the Calm app on my campus a lot and, uh, because we have different points of view. Yes. We have the descendants of slaves and the descendants of slaveholders. Mm -hmm. That is all real, all right? And the question is, how can we have these conversations? Not to suggest you're bad and I'm good, but no, we have different perspectives. And our perspectives have been shaped by how we were raised, how we were reared. I mean, it's just really important. But the only way we can have those conversations is if we build a level of trust. Mm. To know we're not trying to embarrass someone, that we really do want to learn, that I as a college president can learn from my students as much as perhaps they can learn from me. And that, that campus, we work on that. I said at the ACE celebration of their 100th anniversary a couple years ago, one of the challenges we face in America on the college campus is that people rarely get to know people different from themselves. It's one thing to know your own culture, which is fine, whatever the culture is. We've got students from 100 countries on campus. We want people to know their culture. Uh, we talk about international and domestic diversity, but we also want people to know other cultures. I have been studying French. People roll their eyes sometimes because I'm, I'm studying French every day, every day. And I started a few years ago, and my students said, don't you think you're kind of old? And I said, bring it on. J'étudie le français, shocked you avec mes étudiants, right? So I'm studying French philosophers, and why do I tell you that? The more I learn about French culture the more, and language, the more I realize I have so much more to know. Yes. And that, that is the essence of education. And what I'm suggesting is that one of our challenges, ethical challenges, is to create environments on our campuses that will encourage people to open their eyes to others and to not be so quick to suggest they're wrong and I'm right. That's right. We tend to teach people to want to win the debate, not to seek the truth or a better understanding. So that when you're talking, I'm just thinking about what I'm going to say, right? This is one of our challenges. And we tend to not know how to bring from people who think differently from us that level of comfort when they can say what they really think. It's easy to be politically correct and, and people leave the way they came in. They don't really examine self and values. And, and that's our challenge in our right, society. Right. Dr. Diana Eck, uh, who teaches, uh, 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 who heads the Pluralism Institute at Harvard University, wrote a powerful book called uh, Encountering God, mm. uh, A Spiritual Journey from Bozeman to Benares, mm. in which he distinguishes what it means to be committed to diversity mm -hmm. and, and talks about how we tend to celebrate diversity, mm -hmm. uh, as the cliche goes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But the actual work of being engaged in pluralism yes is yes. to engage with diversity. Yes, yes. Not to find agreement mm -hmm. as much as to develop understanding, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which invites us to, in her words, she says, to encounter the holy mm. as seen by the other. Mm. 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 You know, the, the French port of Polonaire has a, a, has a quote, um, La joie venait toujours après la peine. La joie venait toujours après la peine. It means the joy comes after the struggle. Mm. Now my students say, well, Doc, why don't you just say no pain, no gain? Right. To which I respond, mine sounds better. It somehow. sure does. <laughs> <laughs> but, the, but the fact is, the idea is that anything worth having or understanding takes work. Yes understanding another person, understanding another culture, understanding the problems we have in American higher education, in American society. These are not easy challenges. These are, these are challenges that take a lot of effort. And I want to just put it out there from the beginning. Uh, as I go around for the next few years trying to move the needle in producing more scientists of color, I'm also interested in looking at why half of Americans who begin in colleges and universities never graduate. Yes. And what we can do to make sure that when they graduate, they are broadly educated, 
broadly educated, not technicians, but broadly educated and interested in more than simply making money. That will be this next chapter in my life. Yeah. Thank you. The late uh, civil rights leader and educator Bob Moses, yes. who was a good friend of yours, yes, uh, yes. he founded the Algebra Project yep. in 1982. Yep. Uh, argues that algebra is a civil right. Yes. And, uh, and he said math literacy will be a liberation tool yes. for people trying to get out of poverty yeah. and the best hope for people trying not to get left behind. Yeah, yeah. He was an amazing man who also, uh, we had an honorary degree from Harvard. He really did. Yes. I was so inspired by him. Uh, and he spent so much time in Mississippi, as you know, had a PhD in philosophy, actually, mm -hmm. right? Um, and we always laughed about my experience talking about it in the church because I was studying algebra at that time. So I also have always connected problem solving with civil rights. Uh, let me ask the audience a question. How many, many people in here love to read? Predictably, everyone. Um, how many people in here love mathematics? <laughs> now, this is a well-educated audience and it may be 10%. This is the American culture. This is, now, and the other thing is, we in America, of, we, anybody educated would be very embarrassed to suggest that he or she didn't love to read. It is understood. Now, the fact is, as the son of an English teacher, I would say, you don't really love to read unless you love novels and literature. We can all read well. We can read well. We read the newspaper, whatever. But people who really love to read, read novels, if you get my point. Uh, we read Jane Ash Austen, Charlotte Bronte, whatever, Dostoevsky. But in thinking about mathematics in America, people are very comfortable saying, no, I don't love math. In fact, people will often say, how can you put love and math in the same sentence? Mm. That is the attitude in America. It's very interesting. Now, why do I say that? More and more people will need to have stronger quantitative skills for many reasons. And, and I'm not saying everybody needs to know calculus, but when the algebra is a symbol of critical thinking. So the problem, you didn't think I was going to do this. Lynn and Peter won't be surprised, but I'm about to give you a word problem. Now the key is, uh, here's the problem. It's sixth grade, sixth grade word problem. 29 children are in a class. I get goosebumps when I give math problems, all right? 29 kids are in a class. 20 have dogs. 15 have cats. How many have both a dog and a cat? I'll say it again. 29 children are in a class. 20 have dogs. 15 have cats. How many have both a dog and a cat? Why would I take your time to talk about that math problem? Well, first of all, I'm not going to give you the answer which is not the American way. We do problems like that. Secondly, I hope later tonight you'll discuss it. In fact, I hope you dream about it tonight and just keep talking about it. The difference between some of the higher performing societies in math give children more time, more people to, as we do in problem solving in general, to solve a problem. Now, how is that connected to civil rights? The fact is that quantitative skills are connected to technological skills, are connected more and more to what we do in the world today. So when we think about data science that you hear about, this is this field that combines computing and statistics. What the national societies in math today would say, more so than calculus, people need to have some statistical background. I'll give you an example, because even to be a good citizen, perhaps especially to be a good citizen, one needs a solid quantitative background. Um, my colleagues know that the question I'm always asking is about the base. So if I told you that uh, Montgomery County um, has grown its, um, let's just say has grown its uh, Native American population by 200% in the last five years, most people would be very impressed, very impressed. But I would tell you, when thinking about quantitative skills, if you don't know what the base is, you have no idea what that means. But normally when people hear 200% or they hear 100%, uh, we, <laughs> we at one point only had one woman faculty member in physics. 
and somebody put out the fact that we had grown it by 100%. Now, that meant we went from one to two. Mm. I got at least eight letters from college presidents congratulating me on the great progress in physics. They never thought to ask the question, how many did you start with, right? <laughs> so I'm just giving you the, one more example. In my home state, in Alabama, um, when people were lobbying to keep the governor's proposal for increasing the funding for education from, from having it pass, when the lobbyists were not wanting that to pass, they frightened people by saying that taxes were going to go up by a whopping 5%. Now, taxes are very low in, in Alabama, all right? The 5% didn't mean enough, but just by saying a whopping 5%, people thought, oh my God, they're going to bankrupt us because they didn't know fundamental mathematics. Just in the most basic of ways, to be able to think in our society, you'd have to have those quantitative skills. Right, right, right. Uh, UC Berkeley professor David Kerb yes, yes. has uh, argued that uh, the U.S. is facing a college dropout scandal. Yes. Yes. that he says is both a moral and a practical problem for our nation. Yes. And so if algebra and education more generally is a civil right, yes. how are we faring as a nation right. in supporting student success in sure. higher education? Sure. If a young person comes from an educated family, that person will most likely graduate from college. It's just that simple. If someone comes from first-generation college, the chances are very small. Mm. To put it in perspective, in the 60s, you may not, let me just ask this audience, what percent of Americans had graduated from college in the mid-60s, in 1965? What do you think? I heard 10%? 15? 12? 12? Not bad. It, it was actually only 10%. After the all of the civil rights and the killing, the assassination of, Mr. of uh, the president, and the southerner became president, Lyndon Johnson. And right there in 64 and 65, Civil Rights Act, Voting Rights Act, Higher Education Act, and shortly after that, Pell Grant Act, right? But before 1970, most Americans never thought their children, of any race, thought their children would go to college. Those of us who went to college in the 60s didn't realize how small the numbers were of any race. For whites, for blacks, it was only 3 to 4%. For, mm -hmm. and everything was broken down into black and white at that time. For, for whites, it was about 11%. Only 11%. People think, well, it may have been a small number of blacks, but 30, 40% of whites. No. So the vast majority of Americans. Today, what percent of people have a college, a four-year degree? What do you think? 35, 40? 30, 40. Uh, Karen, don't you say anything. You're an expert. You're not supposed to talk. <laughs> I'm kidding. The, uh, but no, it is. It's, it's high 30s. <clears throat> but uh, for whites, it's 41%. For blacks, it's not quite 30%. For Latinos, it's, not it's 20%. For uh, Native Americans, it's below 20%. What's the highest, best educated group in our country ethnically? Asian. Asian. It's about 55%. Now, but that's for certain Asian groups. The others who are not, Pacific Islanders are not. The Chinese and Indian groups, some of the South Korean, right? But, so it depends on the specificity, right? But what is my point? Put it all together, two-thirds of Americans today, 60% for sure, certainly have not graduated from college. And if you've not graduated from college, the probability of graduating is much lower. I'm going to take this. If I can use this. Okay, will this work? This here? Just give me a little difficulty. Do I have to turn it on or is it on? I think it's on. It's on. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Great. Yes. Oh, this is much better. Much better. Thank you. So, so this is what I want you to think about. We normally say, and Peter is an expert with the National Academies for years, that almost 60% of people who start in college will graduate within six years. But if you break it down, you find the most prestigious places and the largest of wealthy publics will have people graduating at 85, 90 plus percent. But well over half of all colleges and universities have fewer than 50, even 40 percent graduating. That's of all races. So if you talk about just most people, probability is a half or less. Right. Now suppose we said the same thing about hospitals, that you got about a 50 percent chance of being successful, meaning living or dying when you go to a hospital. The public would be outraged, right? 
But because this has always been the case, we accept it. We accept it, and it should be unacceptable. And then there are other specificities. The for-profits, the graduation rates are much lower. Some of the most popular of those institutions, I mean, with huge numbers of students, heavily first-generation college, black and brown and first-generation white kids, will have graduation rates below 20%. They cost twice as much as community colleges and the graduation rates so that we have multi-trillion dollars of debt, a big piece coming from the for-profits and then from other institutions. The other point I want to make, though, is that community colleges have become far more important than ever before. Your college in Montgomery County is one of the best in the country. Yes. Give Montgomery College a round of applause, which they really are. They really are. They're quite good. We get excellent students from Montgomery College, from Howard, and from several others. But the key is that almost half, 40 some percent of all American students in higher education are in community colleges. Now the challenge there is still though, helping people to graduate, whether it's with the AA to go to the four year or with some post-secondary credential. And something that might be controversial in terms of success that I will say now is that four year liberal arts colleges will not be for everybody. We have this cookie cutter approach that thinks everybody should be there. Many students don't want that at the same time. And it's, it's, it's awful for a kid to come to college and just go through without learning anything. It's what T.S. Eliot says about somebody who has the experience and misses the point. Mm -hmm. If you go through and you don't really want to just dive deeply and study history, then you're doing it for the motions. What are you getting out of it? Sometimes it's better for students to get skills, get a job, mature, and then appreciate that which can be really a wonderful experience, the liberal arts experience which is what we work on at UMBC. Long answer, but that's... No, thank you, sure. thank you. That's... So, so how have you and your colleagues uh, increased student success yes. at UMBC? Yes, yes. Uh, where now you've been president for 30 years. Right. right. And, and in that context, what is the idea of this empowered university? Yes, yes. And, and how has empowering people at UMBC uh, been, been central to increasing student success. Oh, I appreciate that. The Empower University and the subtopic will be um, shared leadership, culture change, and <coughs> academic success. First of all, first sentence in the book. It's not about me, it's about us. Too often in universities and in our society, we define leadership in terms of the one person, as opposed to thinking about how we collectively must lead. Secondly, it's empowered to do what? Empowered to look in the mirror at self, as a society, as a person, as a university, and to be honest with self. What is it we do well? Yes. What can we take pride in doing as we do it right now? And then what don't we do well? And can we be honest about where we need to improve? Some years ago, we knew we needed to look on students of color and to see why so many were not doing well, especially in science. The report that um, I chaired the committee for and that Peter led in the, in the actual development of the study um, from 2011 on science, American science and technology at the, at the uh, crossroads focuses on the fact that the vast majority of students who begin in science or engineering are weeded out within the first year or two of every race. Uh, it's not surprising that only 20% of blacks and Latinos don't succeed, and Native Americans, the numbers are even lower, but for whites, it's only 32% succeeding through the bachelor's degree with a major in STEM, and only 41% for Asians. Mm. So we call the first year or two of science in America weed out courses yes. across the board. And here is the counterintuitive and stunning fact. The higher the test scores of students, and the more prestigious the university one attends, the greater the probability that the student who starts in science will leave it. So the big joke is often people start in pre-med and they become great lawyers. No offense to the lawyers in the room. But if you talk to a group of lawyers and you ask them how many did you, how you started in engineering or pre-law, when they quietly raise their hands. Because you think of the two big professions, law and medicine. I said this at the national agents, one of the national agencies, and the general counsel said, you just told my story. 
Mm -hmm. I started at the most prestigious of all. There is but one, the most prestigious of all in our country. And I was in chemistry, going to be pre-med. Within a year, I'd gone home and said, I'm going to major in English. Because you got to see in chemistry. And the people in the humanities are far more welcoming. We in math and science focus on the problem, on the problem rather than the people. So it's, it's even more. But most people don't. It's the secret that people don't talk about. And it's why the percent of students in science in our country, people are always saying, uh, oh, we talk too much about STEM. No, only 5% of those students graduating are in the natural sciences and engineering compared to 11% in Europe. All right, so, and if it were not for people coming from other countries, we'd be a third world country in science and technology. Go look in the national agencies, look at the presidents of Carnegie Mellon, look at all the biotech companies in, in, we were just out there in Silicon Valley with our graduates, they tended to be Indian, right? They came there, got grad degrees, they go to different places in this area, and we are very privileged that we get the best from around the world. But, so for our purposes, we needed to figure out a way to help students from this country succeed in the disciplines where they were least likely to succeed. And that's where we started the MAUV program and started it specifically for blacks, because blacks and Hispanics are always at the bottom academically in our right. country. That's just the reality, with few exceptions. And so what we have learned about what it takes has everything to do with what I talk about in my TED talk, and that is high expectations. But not just of the students, but of us, the university. If I go to the board, and I put a problem on the board from differential equations. Yes. And all of you say, wow, you must be really smart. And then I give you a test on that problem or a problem like that. And you fail it. The question is, did I teach it? No. I presented it. But unless you can pass the test, I didn't teach it. But our mindset in the STEM culture is, if I put it on the board, I've done my job. That is a flaw. That is my argument. So people either like my TED talk or they hate me, one or the other. But that is that. But it's the idea of the high expectations, building community. One of the problems in American higher education is we teach individualism. We don't teach people to work in problem solving collaborative circles. And yet in real life, whether you're working at the State Department or you're working at NIH, people learn to work in groups, right? Third, it takes scientists to produce scientists just as it takes lawyers to produce lawyers in any profession, people in religion, pull people into the work. And finally, we have to learn how to be more evaluative, at working to assess what works and what does not. Those right. are the lessons that we've worked on. Right, thank you. Mm -hmm. well, what, what you just uh, shared is, is a problem that I have encountered uh, growing up in India. Yes. And where the emphasis is on rote yes, learning. Yes, yes, and, yes. And, you know, I was a physics major. <coughs> and yes. even physics, math, and chemistry, yes. We, it was drummed into our heads that we had to memorize, yes. which, yes. you know, yes. helped. Yes. But it really did not inculcate, at least uh, in, in some ways, a love of learning. Yes, yes. It was, it was just seen as a means yes. for getting a degree, yes. which in turn would fetch us a well-paying job. You know, if not for my, my math teacher in high school, who taught differential equations like poetry. Yes. What I don't think idea. I would have, I would yeah. have engaged yeah. as much and, and gone into physics yes. and especially yes. theoretical physics and, and used quite a lot of differential equations there. Yes. Give, but, give him a hand for that lovely language, teaching differential equations like poetry. Give him a round of applause. I mean, you, <laughs> whether you understand it or not, it is lovely language. It really is. It is. It's quite nice. I like that. <laughs> that gives me goosebumps. It really does. <laughs> the, the, now, I'll tell you where we, I, I want to be fair to us in America. What, which country has the most confident children in math and science? In the international math and science competition, you got all the industrialized nations, and there's one group of children, 13 and 17 year olds, at the end of the test who will say, we've got this. Which country would say that? It's Americans. We Americans are very confident. We may not know much, but we're very confident. We, we, <laughs> literally, U.S. kids, they, oh, we, we got this, right? <laughs> I mean, they are so confident. And these are our best, right? And they are confident, but they're far from the best. 
But now I say that jokingly, but I also said for another reason, that's something that's powerful about teaching children to be confident. Yes. Even when they're wrong, because you can work on that. It's that independent spirit. We, we have children, we, believe it or not, we entertain groups of teachers and children from other countries. And I have worked with kids from some of the Asian countries. I mean, literally, very smart kids who've come for American experiences, and they will tell me to put a problem on the board with an error in it, where the kids will know it's an error. They'll know it's an error. And I'll look at them and say, is this OK? And they've been taught, if the professor puts it on the board, yes, sir, it's right. Now, the American kid will say, no, you're wrong, Doc. You're mm -hmm. wrong, right? So what we have that's really priceless, we do teach our children to question and to have a sense of self, at least the most privileged. For poor children, we've got a lot of work to do. Yes. And then secondly, what America has is creativity, mm -hmm. from jazz to what we do in the lab that it's about much more, the British way is the rote learning way. When I was in Egypt studying, we had, to, we had to solve the problem exactly in physics and math the way the professor had said it. You couldn't be creative, no. You want, if you wanted the perfect score, you write it down exactly as it was said. So just one example, we're very proud that, how many of you took the Moderna vaccine? Anybody take the Moderna vaccine? Well, the, the woman who co-led the team with Dr. Bunny Graham at NIH is a UMBC graduate. Give us a round of applause for that, please. <laughs> we recruited her from rural, rural, from Hillsborough, North Carolina, when she was 17. She came in, uh, was a mild scholar, went back to Chapel Hill, got a PhD, became scientist at NIH. She's now at Harvard on the faculty, but she's the first black woman in the world to create a vaccine. That should get everybody goosebumps. Well, here's the point. She didn't have to be an A student. She was a very good student. What she had, though, was, and what she has, is a solid sense of self and a lot of curiosity. I. I. Robbie, the Nobel laureate in physics from the 40s, said when he was growing up, all of his friends' mothers would ask them at the end of a school day, what'd you learn in school today? He said, not my Jewish mother. He said, my mother would say, Izzy, did you ask a good question today? Mm. And that practice of encouraging his curiosity made him the thinker. He became, and that, that is the point, that we must encourage the curiosity and the broad thinking. Because Mika Corbett, this young woman who created the vaccine with Dr. Graham, also was a major in the social sciences. And she talks about how that education was in biology and the social sciences taught her to think broadly. And so when they were getting ready to do the piloting, they didn't have enough blacks who were willing to come forth because of the lack of trust. And she convinced my wife, and I, my wife and me to be a part of it. She said, you've got to show people that you believe in this science, in this medicine. Well, she would not have known that if she hadn't had that background to know the history of the Tuskegee experiment and the yes. way people of color think about science and medicine. Mm -hmm. And so the idea overall about how do you create success, you teach them to have that curiosity. You teach them to have a sense of self. You teach our teachers, for all of us, faculty and staff, we have a greater responsibility. We can't just put it on the board. If you get a chance, look at the Chemistry Discovery Center at UMBC, the CDC, doesn't stand for disease. It's about collaborative learning and real-time feedback. And the, the statement we make, all of you went to college, I know, and at some point, somebody said to you in your first year, and I want you all to do it right now, look at the person to your left. Right now, look at the person to your left. Now look at the person to your right. Then the dean or the president said, one of you will not graduate. That's an American practice. Well, we change that. We say, now do it one more time. Look at this person to your left. Now look at the person to your right. Our goal is to make sure all three of you graduate, and if you don't, we fail, and we don't plan to fail. Give us a round of applause for that idea of saying you will make it. That's wow. it. That's what's important. What you described sounded very Unitarian Universalist. Is that right? Our, our approach to religious education, faith yes. formation for our children and youth, yes. is grounded in the principle of nurturing holy curiosity. Yes, yes. That our children are encouraged yes. to ask questions. Yes, yes. Really deep yes. religious questions yes. about the, the intimate and ultimate questions of existence. Yes, yes. And, and to and to be engaged more 
with the questions than necessarily look for answers. Yes. And, yes. and in fact, one of our hymns has a line that says, to question is an answer. Oh. 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 And, and to me, that, that really, uh, your, your point about how that nurtures creativity, yes. and, and cultivates that, that sense of self, yes. and, and the confidence, yes. the assurance, yes. Uh, I think I think is a is a critical aspect of of how how we we deepen yes. learning yes. in in our students. You know, and one of the things we do that I'm very proud of it at UMBC is to teach people how to explain concepts. One of the challenges in medicine, in science, in STEM, is that too often people will say things that most people don't understand and we just accept, well, we couldn't understand it. I would argue that the greatest understanding comes when someone can explain a concept in simple and clear language so that even a child can get the point. Um, and so we often have our highest achieving students learning how to explain concepts. Lynn Schaefer's son, who is is a natural genius, happens to also be one of my mentees and just a brilliant, decent human being, learned early in life how to explain concepts. And so he's now, he could have gone to Harvard or Georgia Tech. He turned down Harvard to go to Georgia for his PhD, he got his undergrad from us as a mild scholar. But here's the point. He was constantly working with other kids to explain concepts in computer science. Mm. And they loved his approach for two reasons. One, they would get the point, but two, he didn't judge them when it took them longer to get it. Sometimes when people are high achieving and they move like this, they can give somebody a look when they don't get it like that. What my mother did for me, because I went through school very early, was to tell the teachers, if you want to keep him engaged, give him two or three kids to work with. Let him learn how to explain concepts carefully and slowly because I talked too fast and I could get the answer and be careless and I wasn't thinking I could do it and all of my life though she was wise enough to teach me to become a teacher at an early age and it's something we have to learn in education when we work with our choice kids for example these are first gener first generation college but worse than that they are first time offenders 500 children at a time heavily of color heavily boys some girls in gangs and they're brought to our middle class campus, which is at the BWI airport, 600 acres, very pastoral. We bring these children in. Years ago, people said, you're gonna bring these criminals to campus? And we said, they're children. They're eight, and nine, and 10, and 12. And they may look hard, but it's because of life. But one of the most effective practices I've seen over the years is when you help one child to become adjusted to the environment, and you give him the responsibility of helping a younger child learn how you act on a college campus, that you don't curse, that you don't get into fights, that you're more mature than you think you are, that you want to learn, right? You know, and um, it's the idea of elevating and empowering people at every level to take some responsibility for others less fortunate or who are younger. That is the UMBC way at every level, and across races and across religions, Right. Very important to say that we will see the Muslim and the kid who's Hindu and the Jewish kid and the Baptist kid and the Catholic kid working on a chemistry problem together. It, it's the best of humankind. Indeed. Yeah. The vision of the beloved community. Ah. Ah. <laughs> Indeed. Thank you so much, Dr. Robowski. Thank you, Ravi. I have a few more questions, but I'm going to pause okay. now okay. so that we have a chance to to hear from the audience, yes, because I'm sure they have some questions that they want to ask you. Great, great. So we're going to take a, a, a really short okay. musical break okay. uh, to experience a powerful spiritual from uh, my sister Yara Allen, who oh. is part of the Poor People's Campaign. Oh yeah, yeah. And yeah. Uh, we'll we'll have that, and then we'll return, and Peter will will ask the questions from the audience. Excellent, excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Very much. Thank you. Very much. Oh. 
hold on just a little while longer hold on just a little while longer hold on just a little while longer i know justice is coming soon pray on just a little while longer pray on just a little while longer pray on pray on just a little while longer i know justice is coming soon come on and fight on just a little while longer fight on just a little while longer fight on just a little while longer i know justice is coming soon Justice is coming soon. I know justice is coming soon. I know justice. Justice is coming Okay, we're back. And we have a bunch of questions from the audience. Thank you for sharing these questions with us. Um, there's two right off the bat that are somewhat similar. One is, are you sharing some of your innovations with other schools? And similarly, are there colleges and universities that are following UMBC's example uh, in terms of programs of STEM education for people? Sure. Uh, we are very pleased to be partnering with the Howard Hughes Medical Institute here in Montgomery County, as you know. and. For some years, we've been replicating the MAUF program at two institutions in a very formal way, and that's Penn State and Chapel Hill, and with HHMI, and the results have been stunning. We have published an article in Science uh, that shows the substantial increase in the number of students of color and first-generation college students who not only are succeeding at the undergrad level, but going on to, to PhDs in those disciplines. I've had the privilege of being in those campuses, and the replication involves a lot of collaboration among faculty, involvement of the presidents themselves, uh, and building community, as we talk about. Uh, I'm really pleased that the Karsh Scholars Program that's talked about in the New York Times today is, is a replication of Meyerhoff. Wayne Frederick, uh, president there, would readily give us that credit. We're very proud that the provost at Howard is a UMBC graduate. The head of that program is a UMBC graduate. So from Howard 
to Penn State and Chapel Hill. We're also replicating the programs out at Berkeley and San Diego, heavily with Latino kids, but some other kids of color, with money from Chan Zuckerberg. That's been very helpful. And we're getting ready with this new major funding to look at other institutions. So, and people come to campus regularly to look at the model of what we're doing. And it's that Meyerhoff model, but it's also a center for women in IT. You may not know it, but only 20% of computer science majors in America are women. And they're often the women who have at least one parent from another country. It's a cultural issue. You'd be surprised, maybe you wouldn't, but just that we don't empower girls to think about these fields and give them the support that they need. It's a bigger issue for women, girls of all races, that literally only 20%, and with so many of the jobs in these areas, and it's not that somebody has to be a techie techie, but we do a lot with digital humanities, for example. There are ways of connecting the humanities with the arts, imaging and digital arts, with the digital humanities uh, to give people more opportunities. So I'm saying that people of color and women are not, in the same way we talk about algebra, or, or fundamental word problem solving skills as important, these technology skills are too. But we have people coming from other campuses to look at the models that we have. So look at the Center for Women in IT or look at the Meyerhoff program as, as examples. So UMBC was recently designated a Research One University. Yes. Can you tell us what is a Research One University sure. and why is this a big deal? Sure. Why, why is it important to our students? I appreciate that. First of all, we were just designated in the last few months a Research One University. Please give us a round of applause for that. <laughs> I have no shame. I have no shame. Of the 4,000 colleges and universities in America, only 146 are Research One. That has to do with the level of research productivity. As measured, you, of course, you think about the books and articles, but grants. It's heavily science and tech on the one side. We have been at that level for some years. We are number 15 in funding from NASA, for example, which is amazing given that we only have 13 plus thousand students. So we have mid-sized campus, but pound for pound, faculty bring in a lot of research from NIH, NASA, NSA, other places. But what's really significant is that we really invested Vice President for Finance here, the provost and others in the social sciences and the humanities over the past decade plus. And so we were able to bring up the research. We already had, had some strong people, but to really invest there, because to become Research One, you've got to show the research productivity across the disciplines. And that, that makes the difference. So we're in that top tier of institutions. At the same time, though, I am very proud that we do a superb job at both undergraduate and graduate teaching and education. Very important to say that. Yes. So here's a provocative question yes. about research universities. Sure. Uh, one of our audience members has just finished reading Walter Isaacson's Code Breakers yes. and asks, I wonder if you have concerns about the increasing trend of universities patenting and commercializing the work of their academic laboratories? You know, I really don't because of academic freedom. I really don't. We can't make people do things. Um, I think there are opportunities for people to work with companies in a variety of settings from bio the biotech companies. You think about the work of Moderna and of uh, NIH, but with University of Pennsylvania working with places, they're working with biotech companies on solving the problems of humankind. Um, similarly, the fact is that we know our country has major defense issues, not just in terms of the military, but in terms of the intelligence community, in terms of technology and defending our banks and our privacy laws, and that if we don't work collaboratively with national agencies and companies, we could find ourselves as a country very vulnerable to people who don't believe in democracy. There is always the need, though, to keep that moral compass. I, I can't emphasize that enough. While I am a mathematician, I'm a strong believer that the more emphasis we have on quantitative and technological expertise, the more emphasis we need on ethical, ethical background, humanities, social sciences, because there are critical questions. Even during the COVID period, there were critical questions about that only could be answered through the lens beyond science. Who are the people who are suffering the most, for example? 
Why is it that they are more exposed? What does income level have to do, or race, or gender, with the prevalence of COVID in different communities? And so it cannot be one area or the other. It's what Jim Collins calls the genius of the and versus the tyranny of the or. It can't be STEM or humanities. It has to be both, all the time, both. And as we become increasingly sophisticated technologically, whether talking about with companies or others, the more we need to keep thinking about the moral code. Let, let me just give you one example that's frightening. One of our graduates of Malhoff, who's now an endowed chair at, at uh, Duke, comes out of Springbrook High School. Then Malhoff, MD, PhD, black. Parents are from Ghana, Kafri Zarasa. Um, has invented a pacemaker for the brain to address schizophrenia and bipolar disease. And he's getting all kinds of funding for the work. It's not gotten to the human level yet. But he has said to me with great seriousness that the time will come soon, and listen carefully, that we'll be able to communicate with each other without using our lips or our mouths. I want you to think about that. That we'll have sensors, and I'll be able to look at you, and you can talk to me without using our lips and mouths. Now, it sounds crazy, but I remember in college when the futurist said that the time would come when everyone would have a telephone in his or her pocket. And the audience just laughed. And I got up being the smartest kid in the world, I thought, and I, I wanted to give them a mathematical solution involving minimization of a distance between people and maximization of the length of the cords. And my point was, there's no way you could have an infinite number of cords from the phones because they'd get all mixed up. And everybody applauded. You see what I'm saying? My problem with all that brain power I thought I had was I couldn't have imagined a wireless phone. If you think about it, several decades ago, a phone always had a cord. So what I'm telling you is, in our lifetime, we will be able to communicate. I said, are you see? He said, I'm very serious. We're about there now. We're about there now. Now, the only problem is I don't want you to know what I'm thinking. That's the problem. <laughs> That's the scary part. But I tell you that because clearly ethical is considerations must go along with that kind of technological advancement. Otherwise, we're doomed. That's Great. Right. Yeah. Um, so there's two questions here that get at issues with regard to the truth and critical thinking. Yes. So critical thinking is a, is a critical uh, skill that we try to uh, transmit to our our, our students. Yes. So one says, will your students be able to discern what is true and how can we encourage this? And the other one also doesn't mention the word truth, but I think it really gets it uh, at that issue as well. Um, do you see a way that social media can help break down barriers among various groups? It seems that social media just makes things worse. And so what are your thoughts about yes. critical thinking? Yes. Our ability, well, media literacy, yes, yes. Uh, and and the state of truth and information in our society, so, and, so I and the role of universities. I appreciate that. There's a wonderful book written by my friend uh, Ron Daniels, president of Ho of Hopkins, on on the role of universities in uh, uh, protecting democracy. We talk about something in our new book, but but I would say several things. When I became president 30 years ago, people would write me typewritten letters. And I would get the letter. Usually they were double spaced, unless somebody was really angry and they'd write them single spaced. And I, I would be expected to write back within two or three days. That would be respectable. Today, you get an email. And if you haven't written back by tomorrow, you are considered completely irresponsive, totally irresponsive. People are expected to respond like that, either to email or text messages. My wife has a way of waiting hours before responding to text. And I said, why do you do that? Nobody does that. She says, well, if you get off a of college campus, you'll realize most people don't always respond immediately to a text when you get a little older. She said she does it because she doesn't want people to expect her to respond within 15 minutes, right? <laughs> and it's another way of looking at the world. And the fact is that, that Good thinking, deep thinking, doesn't occur just because of this. Deep thinking requires time and reflection and being mindful and breathing deeply and giving yourself a chance to look at it from different angles and to hear different perspectives and thinking about the questions 
the questions more than the answers sometimes. We are in a society right now that expects answers quickly. We're in a society right now that um, uses social media to be popular. And it is a major challenge. This is why the technology is ahead of the, of the ethical considerations. We spend a lot of time teaching kids how to use social media. We have not spent the time thinking about the ethical questions. I'll just give you one. People, students would sometimes write me uh, a rather mean-spirited email because they were angry and about something or disagree. And my practice was never to write back. I would call them in. And I would ask them, and I'd be pleasant. They would think they're there to be punished. No, I just wanted to understand your perspective. Because when you write something, I don't care how good a writer you are, Karen, it can be easily misunderstood. Tone, brevity, all those kinds of points, right? Um, but I would call them in, and I said, read this to me so I can see how you meant this. And invariably, when they would read it, they would get so embarrassed, they would always get teary. They didn't realize how harsh it sounded. They just did it on the spur of a moment, right? And it was an opportunity to get them to think about, before you write something that's mean-spirited, stop and think. And so what is my point? We, we teach people about the truth through the approach we use in the learning itself. Whether in a literature course or in a math course, questions of how do we know this? What is the evidence? How can you prove that to me? What other point of view can you have? It's the kind of, it's the environment that, that encourages the asking of questions. And most important, good teachers will tell their students, I am learning too. I don't have all the answers. I just know how to learn. I often quote Beckett, the Irish novelist who wrote on Francais, who said, um, in one of his books, the, this, the, um, the character is studying the dancing of bees. When bees are dancing, they're communicating with each other. And he said this, the character said this, here is something I could study all my life and never understand. But he said it with great rapture. He was absolutely fascinated because the more he studied the dancing of the bees, the more he began to understand. But the more he began to understand, the more he realized there was so much more to know. Now there is the beginning, it seems to me, of wisdom in seeking the truth. That it's an ongoing, evolving process. And that's what we have to teach students. That we never get there completely. We, it's evolving. Yeah. I have just a few more questions. I don't think anybody has mentioned that uh, Freeman's most recent book, The Empowered University, is going to be on sale uh, in the back after the, uh, uh, the event. And um, there will be a book signing as well. So we'll get to that in just a minute. And that's Freeman's and Peter's book, that one, and Philip <laughs> Brown's. And, and all the proceeds go to scholarships for kids. So it's not self-serving. Right. <laughs> so we'll get to that in just a minute. You mentioned Ron Daniels' book, yes. which is entitled What Universities Owe Democracy. Yes. And one of our uh, audience members wrote, you saw the establishment of democracy. How should we respond to the current attempts to undermine democracy? And I would add, what is the role? What is the answer to uh, the question that Ron Daniels poses? What, yes, what, what do, do universities, universities owe? I go back to Justice Brandeis, who said the most important role in our democracy uh, is that of the citizen. It goes back to my point about it's not about one person, it's about all of us. And it is what uh, Fred Lawrence, our friend Fred Lawrence, who's the secretary of Phi Beta Kappa talks about. What is it universities should be doing? We should be teaching people how to form opinions and to be able to present their point of view with evidence. Number two, to be able to listen to other points of view calmly and look for the evidence. And then number three, to work towards some common ground, to work towards some common ground. It seems to me that right now that there are several challenges. Number one, uh, I've already said two thirds of Americans have not had the benefit of a college education. Number two, too many people go through college right now, and I don't mean this in a cynical way, but it's true, without really questioning how what they think might be different if they open their minds. 
to, to hear a different point of view. The, the, the other challenge, though, is that those of us, I'm going to say this in a provocative way, those of us on the different coasts, on the East and West Coast, who are better educated sometimes in some parts of the South or the Midwest, um, without realizing it can be very condescending. We really can be very condescending. And it pushes people who don't have a college education away. Whether they're talking about who one votes for, whom one votes for, or whether one gets the vaccine. We're not going to move people in a certain direction that we might consider the truth unless we find approaches that can get, that can make sure we're opening our minds to hear the other perspective. And universities have to do that. And we have to prepare leaders who can work to help others open their minds and look at the possibilities in all these issues. You've got 30, 40 percent of Americans right now who still haven't gotten the vaccine. Think about what that means for the democracy. That is our challenge. Universities have a responsibility, and, and I often use the term of those to much is given, much is required. We should be teaching our graduates far more is required than we may expect. Okay? All right. Well, let's finish up with two final questions. Uh, one is about race and one is about uh, uh, poverty. So uh, one is um, today's African-American, uh, does today's African-American community in Birmingham have the same cohesion and emphasis on education and success that yours did during segregation? And the other question is, what advice would you give to a child growing up in poverty with parents who have not made it to high school? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let me start with the second question because our choice kids come from families where people have not, nece have not necessarily finished high school and we're working to empower them. And that means several things. A child must learn to have that sense of self, to believe in himself or herself. And we have this responsibility to help that family, that grandmother often to, with that child, but to teach that moral compass in a world that has not shown that child that difference between right and wrong. But of all the skills beyond that sense of self, reading. If you give me a child who can read, all things are possible. When a child cannot read, her future is doomed. And a large proportion of black and white children, even those who graduate from high school, cannot read at the eighth grade level. So of all the things I can say, the former mayor of Baltimore talked about the city that reads. We need the country that reads. We take it for granted if we're educated, but so many adults and children cannot read. And that's, I mean, as a math teacher, I'm saying, let's get the reading skills with that sense of self, okay? Um, when we talk about the black community in Birmingham, it reminds me of what we hear on TV all the time. Every party says the American people. Every group. Two things I often talk about from TV, breaking news. Have you ever heard breaking news that was positive? <laughs> <laughs> it's not breaking unless it's negative, first of all. And there's a lot wrong in the world, I know that, but I have to tell you that, because I do think laughter is important. We can go crazy if we don't have some humor, some way of, of lightening it up. I think it's so important, it's a part of the human experience. My mother said crying and laughter are the elixir of life, you know, number one. But number two, we talk about the American people. Which American people? Depends on what TV station you listen to. There's no such thing as the American people, although every group claims the American people. I'm delighted that in some cases, though, that the American people, the 80 or 90 percent, are on the same side about some things. Women's rights. The, the majority are there. The majority are there with gun violence, right? So in those cases, you can't say. Now, when you get to the black community, it's the same thing. Um, there was a certain black community in Birmingham when we grew up, but, but as we were saying before, yeah, we were blessed to go to college, but most people didn't go to college. They didn't, the parents didn't know to send their, they, they were not, they, for so many reasons, kids didn't go. Even today, think about it. I'm telling you, two-thirds of Americans don't have their kids in college. So what am I saying? There's no such thing as cohesion. You can't even talk about the Hispanic community because there are different subgroups. Can't talk about the Asian community. There are all these subgroups. And then even within the subgroups, you've got the educated people and those who are not educated. So we talk a lot in analytics about disaggregating data and understanding particular groups. The advantaged black community in DC or Washington will be as well educated as any in the world but that's the top 
But the same thing with any other, the Baltimore Washington corridor. You've got the best educated and the least well educated. And there's our challenge, it seems to me, for universities to work to close that gap. Not that everybody has to get a college degree, but they need the skills and the values to be able to live a successful life, to take care of their families, to vote, right? And to be able to discern the truth, to be able to look I mean, all the stuff. When we all were growing up, there were two or three TV stations. And now there is that point about all that proliferation of opportunities, possibilities, and not knowing how do you go to where you can really find what you need to know. And that goes back to critical thinking skills. Thank you all very much. Freeman, thank you so much for coming down to uh, Bethesda and spending the evening with us. Appreciate it. Thank you so much, Dr. Freeman Robowski, for joining us tonight and for your inspiring Kiplinger lecture. It was a wonderful conversation and really grateful for the opportunity to be able to dialogue with you on, on various things that uh, I hope you found to be informative and inspiring. And I would like to also thank all those who helped make this lecture happen tonight, uh, especially the members of the Kiplinger lecture team who have been working so hard for so many months to, to create this, this evening. And uh, to Peter Henderson for being responsible for bringing us Dr. Freeman Robowski to Cedar Lane. Peter, thank you. And to our amazing AV team, Michael McCrickard and Todd Chernikoff, who again made this multi-platform event unfold seamlessly, effortlessly. Thank you. And our hospitality volunteers and Dr. Robowski's staff, who helped us in order to make this happen. Thank you for all your help and support. And uh, as Peter mentioned earlier, we have uh, the, the Empowering University uh, book available at uh, a discount, thanks to the generosity of the, the Kiplinger Fund. We are able to make it available for $15, so uh, we hope uh, you will consider uh, purchasing a book. Uh, again, the proceeds go to support the, the student scholarship, so uh, your, your help and support is appreciated. Thank you so much for joining us tonight, and uh, we hope to see you again at uh, the next Kiplinger Lecture, which will be happening sometime in uh, 2023, and we will have more information then. So I'd like to leave us uh, with some words from the writers on the website Enfleshed, Spiritual Nourishment for Collective Liberation. What do we need to lay down, set aside, divest from in order for all of us to be free? What practices of dominance Investments in supremacy, legacies of violence do we need to confess, repent of, turn from, unlearn, and resist for the sake of our collective soul, for the sake of our kingdom, so that we might become sanctuary for each other, enfleshing new ways of being with each other for each other. May we listen into the chaos. May we lean into possibilities born of fears and sweat and dreams. May we remember our power. May we connect with our source. May we return always to what matters most, seeking justice, practicing kindness, deepening 
into solidarity, listening with and to each other, with the divine, with the entangled interconnected web of holy life in which we live and move and breathe and have our being. May it be so. Amen.